Hello, I'm Robert Lomas, and this is the sixth of 17 episodes of a work called Ten Nights in the Black Lion, which was written by the novelist Daniel Owen in 1859. It was originally written as a serial in a magazine called Charles Abala, which was produced by his friend Nathaniel Jones. This is the fourth episode, and it was published on May the 21st, 1859. Episode 6 the third evening. Morgan and his wife are alone with their sick child as her fever gets worse. She is delirious but talks with great resolve. Her only concern is for her father and she continually reminds him of the promise he has made. You won't forget your promise, father, will you? No, my dear, I won't forget, he said. You promise you won't go out tonight? Until I'm well again? No, I won't, sweetheart. Daddy? What, dear? Come closer. I don't want Mummy to hear. Her father puts his ear close to her lips. Oh, I am sure it will excite and frighten you, dear reader, to hear what she had to say to him. It was just these short words. Then I will never get well, father. I want to die. Morgan broke down with irresistible sobbing that so disturbed his wife that she rushed to the bedside. What's the matter, Joe? she asked anxiously. Don't say, father. Go away, mother. You have enough to upset you already. Don't tell her, daddy. But Mary's words had hit Joe Morgan with the force of a prophecy, and caused such a barrage of fear in his heart that he couldn't hold back his pain. He looked for a moment into his wife's eyes, and then buried his face in the bedclothes, weeping bitterly. The truth flashed through the mind of Mrs. Morgan, causing her to shake uncontrollably. But before she could regain her composure, Mary's low, weak voice interrupted the silence of the room. She was singing softly. Sweet Jesus on your bosom, I will lay my head. Take me in your arms and fly me to the pure heavens. And then Mary fell asleep. Joe, said Mrs. Morgan, breaking the silence with a voice that gathered strength as she spoke. Joe, if Mary dies, you won't forget what caused her death. Oh, Fanny, Fanny! And whose hand struck her? Forget it never! I will never forgive Simon Slade. Or the house where the blow was struck, said Mrs. Morgan, before he could finish the sentence. Mary opened her eyes and eagerly asked for her father again. Father, dear father, she said. I'm here, sweetheart. What is it? said Joe Morgan, moving closer to the bed. Oh, are you there, father? I dreamed you'd gone out, and, and, and I... You didn't go, did you, father? No, sweetheart. And I won't go out. A pleased smile appeared on the child's face, and she closed her eyes, falling back once more into sleep. I think she's a little better, said Morgan, bending over to listen to her steady breathing. She looks that way, said Mrs. Morgan. Now, Joe, you go to bed. I'll stay here with Mary, to be ready if anything is needed. I don't want to sleep. I'm sure I won't be able to close my eyes. Let me stay with Mary. You're tired. Mrs. Morgan looked at her husband's face. His eyes were unusually bright and staring, and there was a strange nervousness hovering around his quivering lips. You need to go to bed, Joe, she said determinedly. You aren't fit to stay up with Mary. Go this moment. But he still resisted going to the next room. It's no use, Fanny. There's no rest for me. I must stay awake. You go. And sleep well. Even as he spoke, he was afraid his wife would notice his arms and shoulders shaking. She kept staring at him, until, driven by his wife's compulsion, he moved towards the other room. What have we become? he asked. What have I become? said Mrs. Morgan. Oh, I'm nothing. Just one of your old boots or something the old black cat coughed up. Then he saw only too well the horror that had captured the heart of his unhappy wife. He could feel the symptoms of the terrible madness which had overtaken him. Get to bed, Joe, as fast as you can, Mrs. Morgan said. By now Morgan was ready to give in to his wife and he obeyed her like a child. He turned back the bedclothes and he was about to get in when he jumped back, whimpering frightfully. "'What's the matter with you, Joe? There's nothing there.' "'I don't know, Fanny,' he said, gnashing his teeth as he spoke. 
I thought I saw a toad hiding under the clothes. Her eyes were blinding by tears as she said, What a fool you are. It's just your imagination. Get to bed and close your eyes. I'll make you another cup of strong coffee. That may do you some good. You're just scared. Mary's fever has got you overexcited. Joe stared down, and then he pushed his feet away from the bed. You know there's nothing in your bed. Look, Mrs. Morgan said. She swept off all the bedclothes onto the floor with one shake. There, look for yourself. Nothing, she said, as she slipped the bedclothes over him as he lay down. Now close your eyes and keep them closed until I bring you the coffee. You know as well as I do, it's only your imagination. Morgan closed his eyes tight shut and pulled the bedclothes over his head. I'll be back in a minute, said Mrs. Morgan, hurrying towards the door. But as she left the room, she turned her head to look back. Her husband was sitting upright, looking scared. Please, Fanny, don't go away. Don't, don't leave me alone, he shouted. A terrible fear in his eyes. Joe, Joe, why are you so foolish? Lie down and close your eyes now, said Mrs. Morgan, placing her hand on his head and pressing him down. Dr. Green was here, said Morgan. Perhaps he could give me something. Should I fetch him? Yes, go, Fanny, hurry. But will you stay in bed while I'm gone? Yes, I will, I promise, he said, pulling the clothes over his face. I'll stay like this until you come back. Run, Fanny, don't waste a minute. Mrs. Morgan left at once, and placing an old shawl over her head, ran quickly to Dr. Green's house. It wasn't far away. The doctor understood at once about her husband's grief, and said he would come at once. She ran back faster than she had come, her heart beating with anxiety. Then a terrible cry reached her when she was just a few yards from her house. She recognised the voice, and she nearly fainted. She rushed into the room where she had left her husband, but he wasn't there. With her heart in her mouth, she went to where little Mary lay. He wasn't there either. Joe! Joe! she called in a desperate voice. Here he is, mother, Mary said. Now she saw that Joe had climbed into the bed behind the patient, and that Mary's arms were tightly clasped around his neck. "'You won't let the toads get me, my dear,' said the wretched man. "'Nothing will hurt you, father,' Mary answered. Her tone showed her mind was clear, and she was well aware of her father's bad condition. "'Oh, my angel, my angel,' Joe said in a trembling voice. "'Pray for me, my child. Oh, ask our father in heaven to deliver me from these terrible creatures.' He looked towards the door, seeing more illusionary toads. "'Stay out,' he said. "'Get away. You shan't get in here.' "'My dear father,' said the child, taking his head in her hands, "'nothing will get you.' After a few minutes he went silent. As Mary looked down at him, she desperately prayed that he would sleep, and sleep again for hours, that sleep would ease his shock. Yes, let him sleep for days, until his nature was exhausted, and sleep would help him struggle hard against death. When Mrs. Morgan came to the bedside, she saw he was asleep. A warm thank you to God welled up from the heart of this wife. Soon Mrs. Morgan heard the quick footsteps of the doctor and she met him at the door. She told him that her husband was sleeping. That's good if he stays asleep, said the doctor sincerely. Do you think he will, doctor? she asked anxiously. He might. He can't be sure. It would be unusual, but desirable. The two quietly entered the sick room. Morgan was still asleep. From his deep breathing it was clear he was sleeping soundly. And Mary, too, was asleep with her face upon her father's face and her arms around his neck. The scene touched the doctor's heart, and his eyes welled up with tears. The doctor stayed almost half an hour, but as Morgan continued to sleep, he went and left medicine to give him directly he woke. He promised to call the next morning. As the clock strikes the middle of the night... We leave Mrs. Morgan to a lonely and sorrowful watch over the sick. I sat in the Black Lion with a newspaper in my hand, not reading but reflecting, late in the afternoon after the above events took place. "'Where's your mother?' I heard Simon Slade ask in the next room. "'She's gone out somewhere,' replied Flora, his daughter. "'I don't know where. "'How long has she been gone?' "'Just over an hour. "'Are you sure you don't know where she's gone?' No, sir. Nothing more was said, but I heard the innkeeper walking heavily back and forth across the room for several minutes. Then I heard the room door open and close. Well, Anne, 
"'Where have you been?' I heard Slade say. "'Where we both used to go once,' said Mrs. Slade, grumpily. "'Where's that?' "'To Joe Morgan's.' "'Him?' Although only a whisper reached my ears, I could sense through the closed door that Simon was shrieking like a horn, and Mrs. Slade also answered loudly, "'If that child's blood doesn't stick to your hands all your life, you can be grateful.' "'How do you think she is?' he asked quickly. "'What can I say? Little Mary is sick. "'And how bad is she?' "'Very bad. "'The doctor says she's in great danger. "'The cut on her head has thrown her into a heavy fever "'and she's out of her mind. "'Oh, Simon, if you heard what I heard tonight, "'What?' he asked in a dark, sullen tone. "'When she's calm, as I said, she's talked a lot about you.' "'About me? What does she say?' She pleads so pitifully. I don't know why Mr. Slade is so angry at me. He wasn't like that when I used to go to the mill. He'd sit me on his lap and put his hand on my head. She said that, asked Slade, sounding upset. Yes, and much more. Once she yelled out, Oh, don't, Mr. Slade, don't, my head, my head! Made my heart bleed. Never forget it, Simon. What if she had died? A long silence followed. "'Our birthright was back in the mill,' said Mrs. Slade. "'There you go. I don't want to hear it again,' Slade said excitedly. "'I've made enough of a slave of myself.' At "'Least you had a clear conscience, then,' said his wife. "'How dare you!' Slade said furiously. "'Anyone hearing you speak would think I'd broken every law in the land. "'You will break hearts as well as laws if you keep on like this.' Mrs. Slade spoke calmly, but with unmatched severity. Simon shouted back at her and left the room, slamming the door behind him. In the silence that followed, I retreated to my room and lay awake for an hour, reflecting on what I had heard. There was such a world of revelation in that brief conversation between the innkeeper and his wife. That's the end of the sixth episode of Ten Nights in the Black Lion, written by Daniel Owen. It was first published in the magazine Charles Abala, on May the 21st, 1859. I'm Robert Lomas, and I've spent the last year translating this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen.